Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are, I'm sure maybe you know some or are one, there are, there are some men out there who absolutely refuse to ask for help. They prefer to take care of things themselves and, and be self-reliant, um, but not my dad. My dad loves asking questions, particularly in a home improvement store or on a family vacation. Now, he might embarrass my poor mother by his antics, but if my dad was ever embarrassed, he never showed it. My dad, you see, he's, he's, all, he's a real logical, he's a logical guy. He's all about getting to the bottom of things, figuring things out and getting answers. And logically, if you want answers, well, you have to ask questions. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is on trial, and there are lots of questions. In fact, there were lots of questions even before our gospel reading begins. On the night of his trial, Jesus was bombarded with questions. The Sanhedrin aggressively interrogates him. Many were hateful or filled with traps. Jesus, as far as we can tell, probably did not sleep the whole night through, and now pagan Pilate questions him as well. In fact, today we're going to look at each of the questions in our reading. Question one, Pilate asks, what charges are you bringing against this man? Pilate is asking the crowds and the Sanhedrin this question about Jesus. Pilate, I mean, he's the Roman governor. He's there to make judgments and hand out justice. That's why they come to him. No one is brought into court without having charges against them. I mean, that's how it works. And from Pilate's perspective, Jesus is you know, a religious teacher, a, a beaten up but cooperative and self-controlled prisoner. But the crowd is acting much more criminal than Jesus is. You see, the crowd's not really interested in real justice. They just want what they want. The answer to Pilate's question is, there really are no charges. They never come up with one. The crowd's answer is, well, we wouldn't have brought him here if he wasn't a criminal. Well, this would baffle even a court clerk. But Pilate probably can't believe he has to deal with this. No charges? Look, this guy is of no interest to me. There's no charges. He's not my problem. But he is Pilate's problem because the crowds are close to rioting. There are no official charges against Jesus. They just want Pilate to kill him, which is what they admit. The second question Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Well, Pilate is trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. He wants to know if Jesus is really a threat. Is he dangerous to the public, or, or perhaps more importantly, to Rome's rule? You see, it's it's Passover, and Passover was one of the most volatile times of Jerusalem from a Roman perspective. During Passover, Jerusalem doubled in size, and so it was potentially much more dangerous. So Pilate wants to keep the peace and prevent religious fervor from turning into political or revolutionary fervor. You see, if Jesus claims to be a king, then Pilate might actually have to do something about him. But Jesus doesn't look like a king to Pilate. He, he hardly seems to be a threat to Pilate or to Rome. And the third question Jesus asked Pilate, uh, the third question Jesus asked Pilate in response to Pilate's second question, are you asking for yourself? Or did others say it to you about me? Jesus is asking, do you genuinely Winely want to know the answer to this question? Are you trying to figure out what to do with me. You see, Jesus only reveals himself as a king to those who are willing to follow him. That's how it works in the gospel. He doesn't say it to anyone else. But Jesus, he won't satisfy people or play dance monkey for those who are trying to manipulate him. You see, he doesn't really have to answer our questions because despite what it looks like to the world, he is the authority. We are not. 
Plus, we sinners were often offended at the idea of repentance, which is tied up in acknowledging Jesus as king. You see, claiming Jesus as our king still means we must repent, and it often means suffering as well. That leads to the fourth question, which Pilate asks sarcastically, am I a Jew? Pilate is not personally interested in this question. He's not a Jew, and so all these conversations seem like a bunch of mumbo-jumbo to him. He's insinuating that Jesus is not his king. You see, Pilate's fully committed to and ruling the Roman way, so he won't even consider Jesus as a possible king. The next question Pilate asks is, what is it you have done? In other words, how did you make these guys so angry? Come on, tell me your side of the story. Maybe I can sort this out to make so that you make it out alive, Jesus. See, the Sanhedrin certainly didn't give Pilate a very satisfactory answer when he asked them a question. So now he's hoping Jesus can shed some light, tell him the story. Maybe Jesus will condemn himself with his own words in his answer. Or, on the other hand, if Pilate knows more, maybe he can find a way out of this Passover mess. I mean, Pilate certainly doesn't seem to hate Jesus or necessarily want to do away with him. Instead, Pilate's looking for a practical solution out of this mess. Maybe they can negotiate or, or be reasonable people and figure out a compromise or something that's mutually beneficial for all parties involved. But Jesus says that his kingdom is not of this world. See, he's not here to make compromises with the world or be reasonable. Jesus is the king. We know Jesus is the king who is to be crucified. The question still remains today for us that I think that I hope we wrestle with. What does it mean that Jesus is a king, but he has no earthly government, national boundaries, or military might? You know, sometimes we are still more comfortable with government, boundaries, and military than the way of Jesus. But Pilate's next statement is, is almost another question. He says, so you are a king then? And Jesus replies quite craftily, you say that I am a king. In other words, Jesus doesn't really confirm that he's a king. He says, you say that I'm a king. But he also doesn't deny it. Now, this was probably pretty frustrating for Pilate, because if he's dealing with an admitted revolutionary, a self-proclaimed Messiah, then he would clearly have the Roman law behind him in dealing harshly with Jesus. You see, Pilate wants to put Jesus in a clearly defined worldly category. That way he can do something with him. But Jesus has never publicly stated that he is a king. Jesus has certainly not called for a political revolution or armed resistance, Jesus has come to wage a different sort of war and win through humiliation, crucifixion, and resurrection. Jesus clarifies that he is not the same kind of king as Pilate. Jesus is not simply some nationalist, nor is he a party politician, yet, yet Jesus is calling people to follow him. Jews and Gentiles, as he puts it, who dare to follow the truth, no matter how weak or unpopular he might appear. As it turns out, neither Pilate nor the crowds dare to follow the truth. That brings it to us. Who is our king? Who is your king? What rules your world? Where do you look for direction or guidance? Who receives your allegiance? You see, the New Testament church was neither Roman imperialist nor Jewish revolutionaries, although it included both Romans and Jews. In the New Testament era, the question of allegiance was becoming increasingly more pointed 
Just as you could argue the question of allegiance is becoming increasingly more pointed today. You see, in Jesus' day, Rome wanted to hear people say, Caesar is Lord. I mean, that was a saying. Caesar is Lord, and Rome's rule is final. The Jewish Sanhedrin, on the other hand, dem demanded that people say, the Torah and the traditions of the elders have the final say. However, Christians were saying, Jesus is Lord. And what Jesus says orders my life. Is Jesus your Lord? Do you listen to what he says? Or do you try to interrogate or rearrange his words? Do you twist it to fit your expectations and denounce your enemies like the Sanhedrin did? Or perhaps like Pilate, if it's not convenient, if it's not relevant to your life and priorities, would you simply like to get Jesus out of your way? Jesus is king. Jesus is our Lord. However, he's not like the leaders of this world. Unlike both the Sanhedrin and Pilate, Jesus did not come to condemn, denounce, or kill people who threatened him. No, quite the opposite. Jesus came to be killed by his enemies so that we could live. He didn't condemn this group or that group. He condemned all the sin that twisted all humans' hearts. Yes, Jesus is your Lord, and he is mine as well. And he came, as we said, to save us, to save us from our sin to save us from this world. And so as we think about questions, as Christians, we live our lives um, as a question, you might say. We question ourselves to start with, confessing our sins, saying, I am in desperate need of your help and forgiveness, Lord. Will you please give it to me? We live to seek every day, asking God questions such as, where do you want me to go, Lord? What do you want me to do? How can I be faithful to you? We ask lots of questions. But because we can see God's plan and his mercy, you know, there's one question we no longer have to ask. And that's this. We no longer have to question the love and forgiveness of our Savior, because he has proven it to us at the cross. And in the cross, your sins are forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.